Um, welcome to all those who are here already. So I just wanted to say hi and thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to continue our new uh, Macmillan Teaching Topics webinar series with this discussion about building student interest at the beginning of the course. Uh, my name is Will Moore. I work with the product team at Macmillan Learning for the Life Sciences. And we are really happy to have this chance to engage with the greater STEM community, um, the series about teaching. So thanks for taking the time to join us. Um, our speaker today is Jim Morris. Jim's a professor of biology at Brandeis University. He's interested in evolution, genetics, epigenetics, the history of science, science education, and many other things, I'm sure. But um, you know, in his professional life, he pursues these interests through teaching, learning, writing, and research. Um, he's also an author of our textbook, Biology, How Life Works. It's published by Macmillan um, for the Majors Biology course. So a few logistical notes before we get started. Um, because of the large number of people in attendance for these webinars, we have everybody muted for voice communications. Um, I, we do want all of you to participate, so I'd encourage all of you to use the, um, the question function in the GoToWebinar taskbar um, that you should have on your screen. Um, I will be monitoring the questions as Jim is talking, and we'll make sure to address as many of these as possible toward the end of the session. So I'm thrilled to have Jim uh, here today. He's been uh, gracious enough to share his time with us and be willing to do this webinar. So I will pass it off to him now and he can go ahead and get us started. Jim. Yeah, thanks so much, Will. And let me begin by thanking all of you for participating, for joining this webinar today. I know it's a particularly um, difficult and challenging semester, so I appreciate your taking the time. I, I'm going to talk about a kind of new technique I've been using, trying out in my classes. Um, I've been doing this in both an introductory intro bio class as well as an upper level ev evolution class. And it's using questions to pique curiosity on the first day of class. And it, this technique kind of came about in a kind of a, an unexpected way. And let me begin by telling you a bit of a story of how it came about. So, so my wife is a kindergarten teacher. And every summer, um, she does professional development with her school. And in maybe it was like two or three years ago, the theme for professional development was um, learning, what was it, like neuroscience, the brain, and learning. And it was trying to think about how, how brain development and how learning go hand in hand, which of course they do, but they were going to focus deliberately on, on sort of neuroscience and the brain. And um, we were going to go away for a week. Um, to a cabin in the Adirondacks, which doesn't have um, internet or cell service. And she had some reading to do. So what she did, instead of bringing her computer, she asked me if I would print out a few of the articles she was going to read. I could print them out. She'd bring them up there and just read them there. So that was fine. I was in my office. I was printing out the articles. And, and you probably know this. As, as, the, as the paper was coming out of the printer, one of the articles caught my eye. It was this article right here. Um, Teaching That Sticks by Chip and Dan Heath. And I, I just thought it was a really interesting title. And what they were talking about in this article, and what I sort of saw as it was coming off the printer, they were talking about sticky teaching. Now, what's sticky teaching? Sticky teaching is teaching that you remember long after it's passed. And you, you all know about this, right? Um, think back to your own learning, college or high school. There are certain classes, certain teachers, certain topics that I'm sure you remember really well. Um, and there are other classes that you probably don't even remember taking at all. And, and uh, I mean, I know I have this, for example. And what they try to do in this article is identify, well, what are the elements that make some teaching stick and other teaching not stick? And so what they do is they go through sort of a series of characteristics of what they call sticky teaching. And one of them, and the one I'm going to focus on today, is curiosity. They say that if students are curious, and this is not a surprise to any of you, but that if students are curious, they tend to engage more, they participate more, and importantly, they tend to remember what they learned long after the class is over. They caution us to be careful not to jump too quickly to answers. I think when we teach, we want, we want students to have that kind of moment where they get it, that kind of aha moment. But what they say is that you can't get to an, uh, uh, sorry, an aha moment unless you have a moment that precedes it, a moment of confusion, a moment where you're puzzled, what they call a huh moment. And so you need to create that huh time in order for students to kind of get it, to get that aha moment. Um, they actually reference um, this behavioral economist named George Lowenstein. And what George Lowenstein says is that curiosity arises when we have gaps in our knowledge. And he says that happens quite naturally um, for example, if we read a mystery novel, 
the gap is we want to know who did it. And so that helps us, that drives our reading. Or um, a sports game, right? You watch a sports game and you want to know who's going to win. And so, and, and what they say is you want to open these gaps before you close them. It's just like not providing answers too, too quickly. Um, so how do you open these gaps? And so what I, I was thinking about this, I was thinking about this article and creating curiosity and opening gaps rather than closing them when I decided to do something different, which is that, and this was over the summer, so I was going to be teaching intro bio in the fall. I was going to be teaching evolution in the fall. And I thought, maybe I should start differently. On the first day of class, and I really think the first day of class sets the tone for the semester, instead of just reading the syllabus or going through the requirements, and those are all really important, but instead of starting that way with that list, maybe I should start by just asking questions. No answers, just questions. And I don't mean short questions, I mean really, really broad questions that we would answer, and not even answer, but just sort of address over the course of the semester. Ask a series three or four really large questions and then kind of revisit them through the semester, maybe even at the end of the semester, and see if that might get students curious about what we're gonna learn. So what I thought I'd do here in this webinar is share some of the questions. I brought six with me. I've, I've tried I have about 10 or 12 of these sort of very big questions, and I sprinkle them in different classes. Um, I thought it might be fun if I just share them with you, and then we can talk about this technique in general. Um, many of you, I'm sure, are used to asking questions, but I like doing this on the first day, and I like that they're broad. So here's the first question, and I'm gonna warn you, these questions aren't kind of literal questions. I'm not gonna put a question on the board. I'm gonna explain something, and we'll see how it goes. So the first question kind of begins like this. If you, if you look at the natural world, or if you just take a walk outside or walk across campus and look at organisms, one of the first, and I'm putting some organisms up here, not ones you'll see across campus, but just to remind you about organisms. One of the first things that I think strikes you is that organisms are different one to the next. Now, if this wasn't a webinar, if this was a class, I'd ask you now, how are they different? And normally I get silence because it's the first day in the first few minutes. But if I just say, okay, for example, they're different colors, how else are they different? And then people start saying, okay, they're different sizes. They move about differently. Um, they reproduce differently. They metabolize differently. Uh, they live in different habitats. They have different cold and warm tolerance. And you can go on and on. They're all really different from each other. And what biologists call that is biodiversity. And what scientists like to do is to, they like to um, quantitate biodiversity. They like to measure it in some way. And there's lots of different ways to measure biodiversity. But one way we can measure it is just to count number of species. That'll give us a rough sense of the amount of biodiversity out there. And then I ask my students, okay, how many, how many species are out there? And it's also kind of a striking thing, and this is, again, not the question yet, um, that most students don't really know um, how many species are out there, but they can't even give a ballpark number. And part of the reason for this, of course, is that scientists don't know how many species are out there, which I think is always, that's kind of an interesting observation in itself. But as you know, there may be 2 million species that have been given a name, and based on the number that have been given a name, we can extrapolate about the number of species that, that are out there total. So if 2 million have been given a name, we think maybe there's maybe 10 million species out there. Some people say as high as 100 million. But the key is that there's a lot of species out there, and we only know a fraction of it. And to give students kind of this sense of this, that we don't know all the biodiversity out there, I note that we can, we discover thousands of new species every year. And here's kind of a bit, uh, a little sample of those. So if I just sort of scroll through the last 12 years, in 2008, I'm gonna give one species per year, but every year we find thousands of new species. So here's a new species of palm in Mad that was found in Madagascar in 2008. I like this example because, you know, palm is a big thing. It's hard to overlook. Here's one, seven new species of deep sea bioluminescent bio worms discovered in 2009. Over the last 10 years, more than a thousand new species in Southeast Asia, such as this one and this one. Moving ahead, the smallest chameleon found in Madagascar in 2012. And we go from small chameleons to monster ants in 2013. 2014, a peacock spider, which I'll actually we'll revisit later on in the semester. 2015, a new canine. So it's not all microbes or tropical organisms, but some of them are in 2016, a new species of plastic eating bacteria. This one I love, a new species of primate named after Star Wars, the Skywalker of Pulak Gibbon. 2018, new fish species live five miles underwater, a record. 2019, the sea slug that can actually photosynthesize, which wouldn't that be great? 
And then again, I'm just picking one per year. There's so many good ones out there. I like this one just because um, high school students discovered it. And this also reminds me is that not only are we discovering new species all the time, they're not always in, found in these kind of exotic places like the rainforest. Um, this one, this one um, was found, as I said, by high school students. And here are two that were found right in Central Park, a new kind of New Yorker, one with 82 legs. And here's a new species of fly found in Central Park as well. So what's the message here? The message here is that there, there's a tremendous amount of biodiversity. Organisms are wildly different once they map. There's a vast amount of it, and we only know a fraction of it. OK, but those of you who are paying close attention will realize I haven't really asked a question yet. So where's the question here? Well, the question or the puzzle or the conundrum is that we could have started off the class by not commenting about how diverse organisms are one to the next. We could have started the class with actually the exact opposite observation. I could have said, boy, if you look around the world, one of the first things you notice is how similar one organism is to the next. Um, so for example, I could look at vertebrates. Now vertebrates, they look different on the outside. I'll give you that. They don't look like they have much in common. But as you know, vertebrates are all built on a kind of common body plan. They have certain things that they share. This is actually a drawing by Richard Owen. Um, who was talking about the archetype, that this sort of idea that, that uh, the, 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 the sense, the, the idea, the, the ethos that all vertebrates share, noting how similar they are. Okay, so that's vertebrates. Well, we can also look at embryology. So or that's as adults. If we look at organisms when they're young, I don't know if you can see, yeah, you can probably see my pointer. Um, these are different vertebrates, fish, salamander, turtles, chicken. These are early stage development. This is later stage development. They look quite different later stage development, but early stage development, they look really similar, almost identical. Now, some of you who know the history of science here know that Heckel might have exaggerated some of the similarities in these drawings, um, but there was a Harvard professor who then photographed um, early stage embryos and did note that they are more different than Heckel noted, but still the point remains, they're remarkably similar. They are so similar that in class, we play the guess the embryo game. And it's funny when you do the guess the embryo game, you show an embryo, which is what's on the on your left. And then I give four choices of organisms and I say, guess what it is. And again, this would be a great chance to participate. Um, since I don't have audio on, you could take a second. Why don't you just take a moment and guess which embryo am I showing you there? Okay, everybody have a thought? All right, let's see how many of you got it. That's the mouse. All right, hopefully a few of you got it. Um, if you'd like to play again, we can. Here's another embryo. Which one do you think it is? Let me give you a moment. Think about it. And of course, the point here is not to get the right answer. The point is to make the opposite point, which is that it's hard to tell. It's hard to tell. This one is the quail. And the last one is this one. You have four choices again. It's funny, in class, I've showed this one before, and um, most people um, by, by far will pick the snail. Um, it's not the snail, and actually, you know it's not the snail because um, I said these are vertebrates, so, and the snail is not a vertebrate, so we even get that little lesson, and it's actually a bat. And at this point, students maybe say they don't believe me, so I say, okay, then let's just watch it develop. So there, it, let's let it go. Here's the early stage embryo, hard to tell what it is, but as it develops, it starts looking more, well, there it almost looks human, more and more bat like until it's really definitely a bat. So, vertebrates, common body plan, as embryos even more similar. And if you don't go down to the molecular level, of course, organisms become really similar. All organisms, of course, use DNA. There's a nearly universal genetic code. They all use the same um, amino acids. They all build proteins using the same protein synthesizing machinery. In other words, they are remarkably similar. And, and so what we have here is a puzzle. We have a riddle, we have a question, right? Which is we have these two opposite observations of the natural world. On the one hand, there's incredible diversity. On the other hand, there's incredible unity. What to do with those? How do you, how do you make sense of these two really opposing views? And you know, for a time, the answer was, that's just the way it is. It, life has this duality and it's hard to make sense of it until, of course, the theory of evolution, which the theory of evolution gave us a way to see that those two um, seemingly contrasting views of the world actually could be held in one model, held in one theory. 
held in one way of conceiving the world and actually makes a lot of sense. And that's why um, Dobzhansky famously said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And that's a question obviously I use in an evolution class, but that is the first question, right? The first question I want students to think about is how can evolution explain these two seemingly contradictory aspects of the natural world, diversity and unity. And, you know, and as we get to things like biogenetic trees and the like, we can revisit this, this theme. But I, but I love, I, I wouldn't have even said that at the beginning, but in the webinar, I'm sort of annotating. I just leave that. And I let students think about this because I don't know if they thought about it in that way before. Okay, that's kind of a longer question. I was just looking at the time. Um, that was a longer question. A lot of these go a, a little quicker. But let me just give you another example. I'll do two or three science questions and two or three outside of science because those are interesting too. The second question goes like this. Um, if you think about Darwin and natural selection, what's the first thing you think of? And generally people say the finches, but that's not, <laughs> that's not what I wanted to hear. Well, eventually they'll get to something like survival of the fittest. And when you think of survival of the fittest, you think of competition, struggle, competition, or I said that competition, struggle, nature, red in tooth and claw. That is competition is a real aspect of natural selection in Darwin. And actually, if you put in the phrase um, natural selection or survival of the fittest into a Google image search, you get images that bespeak competition, violence, struggle, even war. War. So you get images like this, like this, and even like this, um, where you know the strongest, the fastest, the most fit survive, which of course is not always true. Um, well, the most fit, but not the necessarily the strongest and the fastest. But anyway, we see that one aspect of the natural world is this intense struggle for existence, a competition. Um, now, you guys were probably familiar with Google image searches. When you type in a Google image search, the first few um, images are images you kind of expect. But if you go to page two, three, four, five, you get things you didn't expect. And so if you do this for survival of the fittest, you get images like this. But eventually, I found images like this, which is this is a video game called Natural Selection. And again, I kind of like this for this point, which is that look at how they're equating natural selection with violence, um, war, um, and bloodshed. A terrible secret threatens to begin the violence anew and the bloodiest civil war that man has ever known. This is a video game called Natural Selection. And if you look at images from this video, they're images that bespeak violence, death, and war. So the first thing to realize is that so competition is a real aspect of the natural world. But the first thing to appreciate is that competition doesn't always take, it, it's not always rendered in this way. It doesn't always look this way. It's not always um, violent. Competition isn't, and it typically is not, actually. Um, so this next image is going to show intense competition, intense struggle in the natural world. And you might, might want to avert your eyes for a second, but here it is. And of course, there's nothing violent about this. There's intense competition. This is a forest floor in Newton, Massachusetts. That's right near where I live. I live in Watertown, Massachusetts. This is Newton, Massachusetts. Um, a suburb of Boston, and this is a forest floor in early spring. And I asked the students, what are, what, what, what's being competed for here, and how are these plants sort of winning the competition? And of course, we eventually get to the fact that these plants are competing for light, and the way the adaptation that these plants have is that they're leafing out early. They're coming out before the overstory, so they get their the sunlight needed to grow. And so, First point is that competition doesn't always take the forms that we think it does. But again, no question yet. Well, the question goes something like this then. If we think about the world, it's filled with this competition and struggle. Hmm. But I also can do just the opposite, just like we did with diversity. There's diversity and there's unity, there's competition, but there's also the opposite. And what's the opposite of competition? And I try to do alliterations here. Uh, cooperation. Can you think of any times where organisms don't compete, but they cooperate? And again, I would normally open it up to everybody and just get examples of cooperation. And of course, it doesn't take long before students will start volunteering many instances of cooperation, including pollination, which is really one of the, the, the great examples of cooperation, where the, the bee pollinating the flower, the bee getting nectar, and the flower getting pollinated. And this is a great example of, not of competition, but of cooperation um, between two species. And of course, I could ask for other ones. There's bees pollinating flowers, butterflies pollinating flowers, birds pollinating flowers, and because there seems to be a sub-theme of bats, we can do bats pollinating flowers. 
And then for those of you sort of watching closely, you might say, yes, that's cooperation. But notice those are always two different species. Do we ever see instances of cooperation among members of a single species? And of course we do. We actually don't only see cooperation, we see even more extreme forms of altruism where, where organisms sacrifice themselves for the good of others. And the classic example here, of course, is bees. These are female um, honeybees and they're, they are all sterile. So they've given up reproduction um, for the hive. This is, a, this is intense cooperation, it's actually altruism. They're sacrificing something for others. So, so it's not always competition. Sometimes we see these amazing instances of cooperation. Not just bees, this is a building's ground squirrel, which you probably know um, elicits these alarm calls um, when there's threats nearby, like a predator. And they're specific to the different types of predator. And they'll do this if there are nesting um, litter mates nearby, um, particularly if there are close relatives. So this is, an again, an example where the squirrel is cooperating even more than cooperating, it's putting itself in danger's way, so you could say it's acting altruistically, the opposite of competing or struggling. And there's a bat again. Um, you wouldn't think of a bat as sort of an emblem of cooperation or, or kindness. This is a vampire bat, and of course vampire bats do drink blood. But also you're probably familiar, they, they, they nest in these, in these caves or in these areas with, with lots of um, these big sort of broods of uh, big colonies of bats with many, many thousands of bats. Some of them are relatives, but some are unrelated, um, unrelated bats. And it's very, they go out and get a blood meal, um, but they don't all get a blood meal. And so what ones who have been fed will regurgitate the blood, will regurgitate the blood to those who are unfed and sort of helping the colony. This is an example of cooperation, but they're giving up something, so even altruism. And of course, I mean, we can keep going like this. Of course, humans are known for horrible acts of violence and struggle but also amazing acts of self-sacrifice, cooperation and altruism as well. We hold that duality in ourselves. So that leads to another question, of course, is how can evolution explain this? Have we thought about how does it lead to competition, but how does it lead to the opposite, cooperation and even altruism? How can we hold those two thoughts in the same theory? There's another question. Again, they go faster and faster as we go along. This one I like though. Um, what's the second thing you think about when you think about Darwin's theory of natural selection. And now you can say the finches. So the reason why students or any of us really think about the finches, of course, is that Darwin you know, studied these finches and we'll get back to that later. But the reason why they're such sort of an icon of evolution or they're so emblematic is that they have different beaks and their beaks are different sizes and they're exquisitely well adapted for the food they eat. Some, some will crack nuts like this one up here. Some will dig for insects, so it has more chisel-like beak. In other words, the beaks are almost like tools. Almost it looks like the beaks were designed for the kind of food they eat. And we don't call it design, we call it an adaptation, this remarkable fit between an organism and environment. And adaptations are really another hallmark of evolution. If we look around the world, we can see instance after instance of adaptation, remarkable adaptations. And at this point, I can ask the class, tell me some of the adaptations of this shark. You know, powerful tail, keen sense of smell, sharp teeth, you know, powerful swimmer, eyesight, all these things are telling you it's a predator. These are adaptations for predation. These are adaptations for hunting. And we see adaptations all around us. Here's another example. This is not a leaf, of course. This is an insect, but it looks like a leaf. This is an adaptation for camouflage, so much so that it even has these sort of, I don't know, like mold spots, fungal spots right on them, but that's really part of the wing. This is a remarkable adaptation, probably one of the, the most famous adaptations because it comes up in discussion of design and adaptation is the human eye. Human eye is so wonderful, right? It allows us to see, and it even acts and seems like a camera with, a, you know, with the iris and the lens and the focusing and all that. It has sort of all the components, just like a camera. It's a remarkable tool that allows us to see. So this is one aspect, and we can talk about how evolution leads to adaptations. But again, let's think about the opposite. You know, this cooperation and this competition, this diversity and unity, what's the opposite of adaptation? Well, and I've been trying to think of alliterations here again. So um, something that's the opposite of an adaptation but starts with an A, and I came up with an anomaly. There are some, even there are things about the natural world that are wonderfully adapted, and there's things that are anomalous that don't seem to make any sense at all. And we can begin right here with the eye. Sure, the eye is beautifully adapted, but if we get back into the anatomy a little bit, we realize, well, there's some parts of it that are a little strange. And quick, quick anatomy, I'm sure you're familiar with this, but if you, you know, light, light comes in, 
it focuses by the lens, then it, it, it the lens focuses, excuse me, on the retina, and on the retina there's the light-sensitive cells, the rods and cones, that'll send it down the optic nerve to the brain where it's processed. Again, if I zoom in on the retina, it looks like that. There's three layers of cells. I just told you rods and cones, which take the light and convert it to electrical signal, to the interneurons, to these other neurons that go off to the brain. Okay, so that's <laughs> brief anatomy of the retina. Okay, so if you were designing this eye, you would want the light to come in here because the light would come in, get converted to electrical signal, and then be passed to the brain. What you wouldn't want is the light to come in the other side because if it comes in the other side, it has to pass all these other layers of cells, then get converted, then get sent back out. And if blood vessels start to proliferate, it could lead to blindness. So which way is it? And as you probably know, since we're talking about anomalies, it's this way. Light comes in the wrong side. Our retina is inside out. So how do we explain that? Like we can explain re remarkable adaptations, but why is, how can we explain these strange things? Um, but at this point you might be saying, well, sure, it's not perfect, but it works most of the time. But then we can do other, other examples. So for example, these are um, snapdragons. And why are the snapdragons um, beautifully colored? Well, we talked about that earlier. They're colored because they attract pollinators. Okay. That's an example of an adaptation. The colors are an adaptation to, to attract uh, bees and other, other insects. Then why do we see this remarkable ad adaptation like this? Bright colors, yellow, attracts insects, except for this is a dandelion. And if you have a lawn, know that dandelions um, spread and reproduce vegetatively, that they, <laughs> they take off in the lawn, and they don't really need to be pollinated. So why do we see this? tremendously bright color apparently to attract an insect, we see an adaptation where it kind of doesn't belong. That's kind of a puzzle. Or, or how about this? Why do we have human disease? Why do we have disease, not just human disease, why are there diseases at all? If natural selection is so good at ridding ourselves of harmful mutations, why do mutations persist in any population? Why do we have disease? like sickle cell anemia. Now, most students will know that sickle cell anemia has a bit of a double-edged sword quality to it. It can be advantageous as a heterozygote in certain environments, but I could keep pushing this and say, okay, well, there are certain diseases that, um, that aren't, that have no benefit to them, that truly are um, problematic. Why these? And so the question I'm sort of asking or building to is, how can ev evolution explain adaptations, the fit, the remarkable fit between an organism and environment but what about traits that don't make sense or are even harmful? How does evolution explain that or what happened there? Or, 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 or maybe it can't, but it, or can it? So again, I want you to think about these kinds of things. Another question, um, we talked about great amounts of biodiversity um, and biodiversity arises through a process we call speciation where one species splits into two, okay? Evolution can explain speciation, but what about the reverse? What about the opposite of speciation? The opposite of speciation, well, I don't know if it's the opposite, but the removal, the disappearance of organisms from the face of the earth, what we call extinction. Can, can evolution explain both the origin of new species as well as their extinction, or only one half of this? So these are things I want you to think about. These are all sort of science questions, but there's lots of questions we can ask outside of science. And I know particularly in intro bio and also in evolution, I often get students from outside of science and even for scientists, I'd like to think about these fields broadly. So staying in evolution, let me just end with just two quick questions. One from history of science and one from what I would call society. Um, the one from the history of science goes back to our, our, um, our finches. Um, everybody knows the story of Charles Darwin, right? In 1831, he set sail on HMS Beagle, sailing around the world, confused about the natural world. He, bought, he landed in the Galapagos Islands. He saw the finches and he said, Eureka, and then he published The Origin of Species. And a lot of you are shaking your heads, even though I can't see you, because of course that's not what happened. Um, he saw the finches and this is what he wrote in his notebook. There reigns to me an inexplicable confusion. It, that was actually his puzzle. That was his question that got him thinking. It got him thinking, so eventually he understood it. Years later in the Voyage of the Beagle, he wrote, seeing this gradation and diversity of structure in one small, intimately related group of birds, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species have been taken and modified for different ends. So he, he figured it out. Um, but that was his gap moment. That was his question. He figured it out, but that's not my question to you. He figured it out. 
But then why the following? If you actually open the pages of The Origin of Species and read it, there's 13 or 14 chapters, you know there's no section on the finches. And then you think, okay, well, there's clearly a chapter on the finches. No, nope. there's no chapter on the finches. Well, then you're thinking there's a section of a chapter on the finches. No, nope. um, there's a paragraph on the finches. No, nope. are finches even mentioned? And <laughs> they're not. If, if, if this is such a great example of evolution by natural selection and Darwin recognized their importance, why are Darwin's finches not mentioned in The Origin of Species? Kind of makes you want to open the book and read it, or I hope it does. And then lastly, let me end with just a quick one from society, because of course science and society are intimately related. You know, evolution is not just the stuff of, say, museums um, or, or courses. It, it's, um, it's relevant. It's relevant to so many pressing environmental and, and um, public health um, and um, the world around us. Um, so, for example, it's, it's relevant to the emergence of infectious diseases like HIV, Ebola, Zika, and of course, coronavirus, right? It, it can help us explain where these come from, how they're changing, and how to develop vaccines to them. It's relevant to past pandemics, whether the Black Death and how that shaped our genome. It's relevant to um, epidemics in other organisms like um, honeybees. It's relevant to thinking about the genetics of small populations and endangered species and conservation. It's relevant to one of the biggest public health crises we have right now, which is when we, as we give more antibiotics, of course, organisms don't develop, they evolve resistance to antibiotics. The, the evolution of antibiotic resistance is a consequence of an evolutionary process, and it's getting to be a major problem as the emergence of multi-drug resistance um, bugs, microbes emerges. So, so evolution is incredibly relevant, and the again, keeping with my alliterations, the opposite of relevant is rejected. Why then, oh, I have one more, here's, here's one more, why then is it so widely rejected? That evolution is so relevant to so much that we talk about, and yet it's very widely rejected. And these are just screenshots. It, we, you can go on the web, so find and find many places where it's rejected. Louisiana Open School Door for Opponents of Evolution, Anti-Evolution Measure, Advances in Tennessee, Missouri Right to Pray Law could limit the teaching of evolution. There's an intelligent design hired by Ball State University. Um, South Dakota bill leaves evolution skepticisms up to the teachers. In Turkey, schools will stop teaching evolution this fall. Um, that's 2017. I'm just moving uh, in time. Florida residents could soon get the power to alter science classes. And, and I'm bringing up this question. It's very relevant and it's rejected and they not necessarily oppose. If you're interested, there's another webinar by Andrew Berry, and he talks about evolution and creationism, and he talks about them as, as you don't have to think about them because there are ways to, to, to um, have a very spiritual and religious belief and believe in evolution. And I think sometimes we polarize these more than we need to. Um, a guy who says dinosaurs were a Noah's Ark to review Arizona's evolution standards. This is an interesting article in Scientific American, oh, I don't know, a year or two ago, 2018, that even people who believe in evolution and teach it may shy away from teaching it because of these, um, these ideas. Research shows that 60% of American teachers avoid or skimp on teaching evolution, and a growing moment is trying, movement is trying to change that. And this is something that Andrew showed. This is a bit old now in 2005. If we look at public acceptance of evolution in different countries where red is acceptance and blue is rejection and yellow is, is I'm not sure, the United States ranks. Um, towards the bottom. Um, and 2014, about 42% will reject evolution. And I checked the Gallup poll more recently, and these numbers hold pretty steady. So that's my last question. Why is evolution both so relevant and so widely rejected? Which is a really interesting question to begin to tease apart. Um, those are some questions. I have others, but I thought that that's about my time. So I'm going to stop there. I do want to end with just two um, two little observations, um, and this might spur some discussion. This is a book about by Scott Sampson called How to Raise a Wild Child. And it's really about getting kids outdoors, so nothing to do with this. But he says the same thing as I was just talking about. He talks about curiosity and curiosity arising through questions. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to play a little clip. Um, I'm just going to, I queued it up. Um, hopefully you can all see it, but somebody will flag me if you can't. I'm just going to play just a few seconds of this and listen to what he says. It, it really echoes. And it, I heard this on, I think, NPR right when I was thinking of this idea. And just see what happens. It's a matter of noticing nature, 
engaging with it, literally hands-on. Forget this stay on the trail stuff. Get off the trail once in a while. Let the kids throw rocks and climb trees and stuff. And then promote that sense of wonder. And as a nature mentor, an adult, the, uh, the key here is to not be there with all the answers. That's the temptation. But you don't need to be an expert. In fact, you don't need to know any answers. It's much more important to ask questions because questions are the things that provoke curiosity and wonder. If you get kids outside and you ask them questions about it when they come in, you can turn what was potent, potentially just a mundane experience into something that they may remember for a lifetime. You I just, I mean, couldn't have said it better, right? He says, ask questions and questions promote curiosity and wonder. And I think there are ways to do that in the classroom. And finally, just my last little observation before I wrap up and take your questions is part of this was about asking questions and part of it was about piquing curiosity, but it's also about um, the start, the start of a semester, the start of a class, but also sometimes you could think about that this, the first few minutes of a class. I think the way you begin something can really set the tone for the hour, the hour and a half, the semester. This is an article um, from two years ago in the Chronicle of Higher Education, which isn't talking about asking questions, but it's really about how important the first five minutes of class is. And what I like about it, it's drawing your attention to those first impressions can set a tone, whether it's the first few minutes of a class or the first class of a semester. Um, this is by James Lang, and you can find it's just it's in the Chronicle of Higher Education, but it draws your attention not to the question part of it, but to the beginning part of it. So I'll stop there. I think that's been about a, a half hour, and I know we'd like to take some time for <laughs> for questions. If you have questions of your own, or if you have anything to share, I mean, I I I am always looking for kind of ways to engage students, get them to participate, um, and and help them remember things. So I'd be curious what what kinds of things you've tried as well. Um, thanks for listening. Thank you, Jim, that was great. Um, okay, question. So have you gotten feedback from your students about this? I, I know the goal was to you know, create something that sticks with them. Have you gotten anybody who's told you that that's actually been, been working? Absolutely, so <laughs> I mean, I think in certain ways, so first of all, and I, maybe I should have said this, these aren't questions I just put out there and then leave and never revisit. So one of the first things is that when it comes up, so I mean, a good example, and I already hinted at this, when we do phylogenetic trees and we talk about common origins and diversity, you can go right back to that first question and really say, this is a picture of what we were talking about at the beginning, common origin, you know, diversity at the tips. You can see unity and diversity being held in one model. And that's just one example, but as we come about it, I'll remind them of things we've done so that we're picking up this question now, or we're going to begin to think about ways you might try to address it. And then at, actually at the end of class, and I've started to do this just to sort of close the loop, we actually talk about them all, but um, with, with these kinds of what we've learned, now what we've learned in mind, and I think students are really interested in how far they've come over the semester in terms of at the beginning, either the question didn't make sense, or maybe for some it wasn't that interesting, and some I think it was interesting, but they really do have the language to begin to unpack it, to have a, an answer to it, to, and some of these I have either come, like not one answer, many answers, or, or, or just problems to think about. So that's good, and then I, what I started to say at the beginning is then on student evaluations. This, you know, doesn't come up all the time because nobody's asking about it, but it occasionally comes up that they like this kind of, something kind of interesting on the particularly the first day. I do this in microcosm um, and sometimes I'll ask a question at the beginning of class and we do something, activities, lectures, you know, various things. And then at the end, we revisit that same question. So it's in miniature what I was just talking about. Um, and that too, I've gotten some comments on from students. So they do seem to like it. I do think you have to be careful. It, there's that Goldilocks thing, which is you wanna challenge students, right? and you don't want to give them the answers, but you don't want them to be lost either because that can lead to frustration. And I think finding that sweet spot is, is difficult, especially in a very large class, like an intro bio class. So beyond um, getting things to stick with the students better, do you think it changes the impression, the student's impression of the course and how they think about the material? Well, I do actually, I've been thinking about this some more. Um, I think one of the things, yes, because I think especially in intro bio, for example, I think students could be left with the impression either that we understand everything 
or that you know science is just a series of facts and things we memorize. But one of the important ingredients of the process of science is the ability to ask questions and to ask good questions. Not well, like questions I'm asking here, sort of. Um, but I think, first of all, I think it brings up the importance of just asking questions, right? It's something we do as scientists. But this has actually been um, inspiring me to do something else, which is instead of always presenting stuff we know, take the last few minutes of a class or the last few days of a semester and talk about all the things we don't know. Because of course, just like species, we only understand probably a fraction of the world out there. And there's many more unanswered questions than there are answered questions. And I think this is really important because I think this, again, sets a tone that, that well, one, science is about asking questions and that we don't know everything. And science isn't about just memorizing things we know. It's learning things we know so that we can ask the next question. So that's been sort of interesting. I don't remember your, I don't know if I even asked your question, but it, oh, did it change their impression of the course? I think it changes their impression of science and the nature of science, which is ultimately what I want them to do. But the other thing I always say is that one of my goals in teaching is, um, of course it's to teach natural selection or mitosis or, I don't know, signal transduction or whatever. But I always find if you can just get students interested, if you get students interested, especially as freshmen, but if you get them interested, they will go on to take another course and then maybe another course, or they'll pick up the science section of the newspaper, or no, I guess nobody reads the newspaper anymore, or whatever, online, um, and, and they'll read it, and they, and they won't think of themselves as not a science person. They're, they're, everybody's a science person in the sense that we ask and answer questions, in the sense that we have a body, in the sense that we live in the world, and the most I want them to do is to leave the class more interested in science than they entered it, and I think changing that attitude um, I, I think that's critical. So I think there's a bit of humility in saying these are there's some open questions out there, and there's a lot of questions left for you to answer, and um, and that science is not just a collection of facts. I think I ran around that one a little bit, so I'm not sure if I answered your question or not. Uh, that's fine. Okay. Um, so another one that came in, I think, is very very timely. Um, can you use questions like these in an asynchronous learning format, and can it still be as effective as it would be in the in a in person class? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I haven't, wow, that's, in, that's really interesting. So I haven't tried it actually, because this, this is a class that I'm not teaching this semester. So I haven't tried it. Um, let me just think for a second. Um, I mean, sure, right? I mean, I could, I could record this and people could think about it and we will come back to it. So on a first blush, yes. Um, I'm trying to think, I, I, I taught and I was teaching anatomy and a, in, a, in the remote session um, in the spring. And we do these um, clinical cases every Friday. And, um, and if you think about it, a clinical case is a puzzle because uh, you pre I don't just present it all out. Just, somebody comes in shortness of breath. Okay, let's, let's talk about that. Um, and, and we tease it out, then you give a little more information, tease that out. And so we did that, I guess, in two ways. So we did that with students there but it was also a recorded session so i guess in that way people could visit it afterwards and still go through it at their own pace i guess it's better synchronous but i don't i think it could be done asynchronously though that's that's a really good, that's a good question i think like everything it kind of you have to make adjustments for for doing this online but it still can work and we're sort of doing it here in a way i mean i know it's a synchronous but i know that um well it's going to make this available outside of it uh, of this webinar as well yeah thanks sure um do you think this is more impactful or better suited to an introductory level course versus an upper division course yeah i was thinking about that and that's a really good question thanks for asking that um i think you can come up with broad questions everywhere so i guess the ones i picked are all evolution so these are ones that i would more use in my evolution class oh but you can think of, of well first of all i think a lot of these especially the diversity unity one is fine for intro bio, right? It's one of the big themes that we're trying to get across. Um, but there are all kinds of things that you could ask. So, well, first of all, there are certainly questions that are relevant to any course. Um, but I think, yes, I mean, I, I've done it in intro bio and I've also, I think it's almost more important there because those are the students, you know, when students take an upper level science course, they're mostly science majors and they're gonna either go into science or medicine or, or public health or, or allied health or whatever. Um, but it's intro bio, or maybe even non-majors bio, those are the ones that you want them to 
really engage them. And so I actually think this could work really well. I think you have to think about broad questions that you're gonna get to, but that also don't have an easy answer right up front. And so it does take some crafting to sort of come up with these, but I think a little thought. I think, yeah, I would almost think it's more important. I think, because I think what you're trying to do, or what I'm trying to do is, again, um, get curiosity and tell them that asking questions is, is really a part about what we're, of what we're doing. It's an important part about what we're doing. And that the and this sort of um, discipline of I'm not going to give you all the answers. I want you to either through an activity with students or through reading, through homework, you're going to figure some of this out yourself. Great. All right. Um, that brings us to the end of the questions we had, and it also brings us to the end of our time slot. So I just want to thank you, Jim, for your presentation today. Um, I want to thank everybody who decided to attend this live. And I also want to reach into the future and uh, thank everybody who is viewing this later on uh, for, for your attention to this as well. So thanks, everybody. We're going to wrap this up right now. And uh, feel free to reach out. Um, if you have any more questions, you can feel free to email me, um, reply to the invitation you saw for this in the first place, and we'll get back to you. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody. Nice to see you.